Today is Father's Day, and today is a wonderful day. You know, we've been having some challenges, of course, in our culture and all the stuff with the corona and all that. But, you know, we want to honor our fathers today. And we know that some of us were not able to honor our fathers the way we would like. We want to thank you, fellas. We want to thank you, men, for stepping up and doing what's right when a world turns for what is wrong. You know, you're used to hearing me preach a lot. But today we got something different. We actually had a forum that we did on Zoom online of men, just a few men that I respect. There's a lot more, but there's a few men that their fathers, their husbands, they've raised kids in all different ages. And uh, some of them are even grandparents. And we were able to be able to have a conversation about manhood and fatherhood. And uh, it was a blessing to be able to talk with these guys. I learned some things from it, and I know you will too. So I know this is a little different from what we normally have. But I want you to watch this next video, me talking to some great guys, and uh, we're just talking about what does it mean to be a father in this year, in this day and age, in the world we live in today. What was your father like for you growing up? What, what, what experience did you have with your dad? I can remember my dad, and I was the baby of the family for a long time, and I just stuck to my father, and wherever he went, I went, and he was such a great father that he, uh, we didn't have much per se, but we always had love, and he would always take us to church, and sometimes that meant for me, for him carrying me to church. I would sometimes fall asleep in church, I fall asleep around church. That means after church, he would have to carry me home or halfway home. Wow. And one of the other members I remember was that uh, he was a sharecropper and he plowed. And I was known as a water boy. And when I would see him come to the end of the road, I would grab the bucket of water to take out to him. And when he would finish drinking this water and start to plow again, I would get between the plows with him and try to make every step that he made. That was called uh, uh, being in his step, following in his footstep. Wow. And following, until this day, I guess, until he passed me, I was continuing trying to follow in his footstep. Wow. And so I had great memories of my dad. And uh, uh, that I have tried to pass down to my kids. I tried to and share memories. I remember the memories when I would come home from a, from an overseas tour or something, getting in the backyard, passing the football around with my son, older son, Steve, or something like that. So I always stayed involved with my kids. So that was the interaction between the top generation and the generation below me. You know? Well, my dad was absent when I was growing up. Um, we lived in California and he lived in Iowa. And uh, I saw him very seldomly, um, uh, which was probably a good thing because he was uh, had a drinking issue. And, uh, and he did move out to California when I was about almost 14 years old. And uh, my life took a little bit of a turn at that point right as I was going to high school and it wasn't necessarily for the best probably uh, but um, you know I do remember my dad took me fishing a few times up at Lake McSwain when he came down uh, he passed away several years ago but a couple 20 or so years ago but uh, um, I didn't get a whole lot from my dad to be honest with you wow that's which is kind of a I went into being a father without a whole lot of knowledge you know it was like okay I don't know what it's like to have a dad. I don't know what it's like to be a dad. So, you know, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes quickly, <laughs> you know, <laughs> from lack of, you know, maybe overcompensating at times, you know, to try and over, you know, be, be an over dad instead of just be a dad since I didn't really know what I was doing. But, um, you know, if you live and learn, I don't have any regrets or any, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's just it's the way life goes. And, you know, a lot of people have had a lot worse. So, um, but, you know, well, in, in terms of the husbanding part, you know, whoo, you know, I, <laughs> if I, I wish I knew, you know, I wish I walked then like I did now, 
you know, and, and, you know, when I got married, I had three kids right away because my wife had three kids from her previous marriage, you know, and, and, you know, I, I could have done a lot better by them, you know, had I, had I been walking straight myself, you know, and I, I, I don't, again, I don't regret anything that happened because you can't go back and change it, but, you know, you can learn, you know, from, from the past, from your own past and, and, you know, um, I was a little older when I got married in the first place, so I wasn't, you know, fresh pup out of high school or anything like that. So I thought I had it all under control. I thought I knew everything, you know, and uh, and I quickly learned that, of course, once you get married, you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a very uh, wonderful, wonderful relationship with my dad and a kind of an unusual relationship in that I had the opportunity to work with my dad uh, for many years. We probably worked uh, eight, 10 years together. Uh, he had a company and uh, he needed some help. So I came on board and we traveled all across the United States uh, doing, doing different jobs. So, you know, you spend six, eight weeks with, uh, with your dad, just going to work and, and uh, doing doing what we did, you know, which uh, just, you know, working and, and troubleshooting and things like that. And a lot of people can't do that, can't work with their parents. You know, it's you start fighting or you start any any working or trying to, you know, interact with you, any of your relations can be difficult. But my dad is just such an easygoing guy. And uh, it was it was really a great relationship. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot just in life in general, too. Um, you know, when I was a kid, he did travel uh, quite a bit. My senior year of high school, uh, I did not see him for the entire year. He was doing a job in Saudi Arabia. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, he left when, uh, when I entered school, and he came back and was able to see my graduation. Wow. Um, but he was gone for that entire year doing doing work. But even still, you know, we'd get, and this was back in the 80s, so, you know, we would get uh, tape recordings in the mail and pop them in the tape player and listen to him, you know, his messages, and that's how we would communicate back to him. So it was, it was a little bit different time. We didn't have, you know, this. So, but uh, yeah, very honored. Um, Dad's still alive, you know, doing well and uh, saw him, matter of fact, talked to him this afternoon. So awesome. uh, yeah, very, very good relationship. I've been very fortunate. God blessed me uh, a lot with uh, the kind of dad that I've got. My relationship with my dad right now is, is good. Um, of course, you know, we're not all perfect, um, but there's some things that I really respect my dad for is, is when I look back, I always remember him standing up for what was true, trying to do what was right. Um, by people just in general you know he taught me principles like um, when you go to the river you leave it cleaner than you found it you know type of type of principles um, and you know I'm really thankful for the things that he bestowed in my life principle wise like that um, he was a gold miner so I, I spent a lot of time um, up on the river I, I grew up in the mountains on the river um, I would go to school and, and during the summers I would spend all summer with him and we'd uh we'd, we'd camp in a trailer and, and he'd gold mine during the day and and uh we'd have our campfires and and whatnot and and uh so I grew up up there and, and I think that that gave me experience that uh, a lot of kids don't get these days because um, you know a lot of gener the generation now a lot of kids are stuck behind the gaming stuff where my dad taught me about real life and and how to survive out out by myself and and uh, one of the things that I really respect my dad for that he taught me was um, when I first got my motorcycle I was seven years old when I first got my first motorcycle my dad wouldn't just fix things for me he would tell me son if you want a bike you have to learn how to work on it and he would watch me try to fix it until I would cry and I thought that he was just doing it to be mean you know, and, um, but now that I'm older, I look back and I see what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He was wanting me to 
try until I couldn't do it anymore. Just like the Lord wants us to uh, push. And then he is that gap filler. That's how my dad treated the situation. And uh, when he saw that I was frustrated to no end and that I couldn't do any more, then he would step in and show me how to fix it. Hmm. Um, I didn't know that then. But, man, I look back and I, I'm just very, very thankful that my dad did that because yeah. it taught me a lot. And it has played a part in what I do for work now and helped me to be a problem solver in those types of things. So I, I really respect my dad um, for doing that. And for teaching me, you know, one of his, his life verses were um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, he taught me that. And another memory, just real quick of my dad, we used to uh, sleep in the back of the truck on the gravel bar at the river. And, uh, and he would sing, you know, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, <laughs> you know, and uh, it just sticks in my head. You know, and uh, those those memories are my dad implanted something. He he put seeds in there, mm. and uh, I th I thank him for that. So I learned a lot that way, and um, he's doing pretty good now. But we we talked. He he did have a uh, neck surgery, and he's actually um, in the hospital in recovery right now with um, some pretty bad pain. So just keep him in prayers. Yes, yes, cool, cool. Yeah, your dad's an awesome guy. Awesome guy. I, what what advice or what would you say to someone that says, you know, I struggle with that concept of God being my heavenly father because my earthly father wasn't a great father. What advice would you give to someone? To that, actually, when I had my child, when I had my children, one of the things I think that it taught me was that it gave me a realness and an experience to how our heavenly father looks at us and how he is a I mean that love that we have for our children that when our children do something wrong that would never break that love that we have for that for our child and that is the same way and I think God has made it that way that relationship that we have with our children is the same relationship that he is to us he is our heavenly father and he looks at us that way you know and having my children really brought that to an experiential level um, to really experience the kind of love that God has for me and that God has for you and anybody else that will put their faith in him. Um, it made it real. That's good. That's yeah. good. You know, yeah. I, I, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny. I have a, a before and after take on just about everything in life now, <laughs> you know, before a couple of years ago and, and after, um, and it, it, you know, I would get angry sometimes at my, at my boys and I'd yell at them and stuff. And, and, um, and, and I don't yell at them anymore. And, you know, I don't, I, I, it's not that I don't ever get angry, but you know, you, there's this, it's, it's, it's kind of like the fruit of the spirit, you know, that it, it, it's, it's not something you strive to do. You know, these aren't things you don't strive to display these things. It just happens. You know, these are the types of things that flow through you and that's, and, and if, and if you're really, if God is your father and, and, you know, you're, you're feeling or the Holy spirit is in you, it just, it permeates through you and what, in the way you, in, in the relationships and in the relationships with my children have changed, you know, because, you know, I, and they see a different me, you know, I'm not as funny as I used to be. Apparently I used to be a lot more funny because, you know, but, uh, you know, but other than that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, and it's and it comes from above and they know that and they see it and they understand it. They know, Hey, this isn't just dad here. This is, this is God here. You know, not me being God, but God is working through my father to, to bring, you know, about something for me, you know, and I, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience, actually. So, Jim, so, so for you, not, you know, you shared a little bit about, Jim, you shared about your dad and how your dad was a little bit. Um, so when God says that I am your heavenly father, does that, would that, do you think that that would scare you? Or does that scare you? Like, oh, gosh, you're like my earthly father? Or do you feel relieved that, wow, like I have a heavenly father that is not like my earthly father, that is not flawed, that is not, 
you know, um, you know, we don't want to disparage our fathers because we know that humans all have struggles. We all do, but we also know that we're all flawed, you know, um, you know, how do, how do you internalize that when God says, you know, I am your heavenly father? Well, you know, it, it, the first thing it does, it works through me, you know, and, it, and it's like, wow, you know, um, just the whole concept of, of grace, you know, and, and of, of it is okay, you know, and I am okay because I have, you know, a father up there that, you know, that watches over me, you know, and that, ha that has, ha has sanctified me and reconciled me, you know, and, and um, it, it's like, it makes everything okay. Yeah. You know, it used to be, I used to look at it as, as, oh, uh, well, you know, so I didn't have a father. You know, I really didn't. I mean, I had a father, but I really didn't. I didn't really have a father. Yeah. But th there's kind of a, 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 it's part of that. I think it's part of that fruit, the Holy Spirit process that, you know, it's like, it makes it all okay. Yeah. yeah, It's okay. You know, it's all right. And I can, you know, and I can, you know, I have peace with it. And it's a lot, it's nice. It's a good feeling. Amen. I know for me, I know um, I, I, I've had to learn that, um, that, you know, my, my heavenly father is not, he's not going to betray me. He's not going to uh, abandon me. He's not going to, uh, I can't hold what my earthly father did against my heavenly father, you know. Um, and I've, I've had to learn to do that. I think a lot of, so there's a lot of people that do struggle with that. Um, maybe they don't recognize it immediately, but they uh, internal, internally, they struggle with looking at God as their, as their Abba father. Um, when, you know, their earthly father was maybe just, you know, is no good, <laughs> you know, no good, you know, um, and we got to realize that our Heavenly Father is different. I know my Heavenly Father has taught me how to be a husband. My Heavenly Father has taught me how to be a man. Ephesians 5 has helped me so much on how to be a husband, um, and, and I had to learn that because um, I, I couldn't have that example of my dad. I couldn't use that example in my life, um, and, uh, you know, there's some things I did take from my dad, some good things, but there was also, I had a tendency to do some bad things, too. And, um, you know, uh, I had to, I had to let God help me with that. But what are some of the challenges that first come to your mind that you see, uh, in, uh, to fatherhood in today's culture? I see a lot of today. I, I, I tell a lot of people we're getting in the end times because you see a lot of morality starting to slip away. You see a lot of things that are starting to, to really move toward those times where there won't be people standing up for God. There'll be people just pleasing the flesh. And uh, it's, it's a struggle, you know, with that. I think now that the kids are under a tremendous, tremendous load of, uh, of the, uh, in the internet, uh, the peer pressure. And I think this, the, they are poor, uh, by the internet and so you have to be firm in your family values because they don't always know what's right and what's wrong they don't have god in their life they will drift away so i think that that peer pressure that they have out there is a and the media and they see all kinds of things there's so much to do other than uh, come to church and listen to a wonderful message like we heard today. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm, I'm just, you know, but anyway. That's, I'll go my wallet. I can't pay you, Brother Al, for that compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the peer pressure is one of the things that kids have to go through today. I agree. I agree with my brothers here, you know, and, and I think that it is a product of society is what's happening to our, our next generation. Um, if you look, um, there's a lot of things that are being accepted that the Bible clearly says is not acceptable. Um, you know, and, and it's being called the norm and it's being accepted as the norm. And I think that's uh, a big problem. Um, kids grow up with society telling them that this is normal. It's okay. And, uh, but the Bible, the word of God clearly says that it's not. And, you know, like you said, you know, we're, our nation has gotten away from what it was founded on, which is the word of God. And so now our kids are believing something 
something different. And um, it's almost like there's not an absolute truth anymore, yeah. you know, in, in this next generation. But absolute yeah. truth is real. Yeah. Yeah. So, so question for, for you guys, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to read this. Uh, this is Colossians chapter three, verses 18 through 20. <laughs> um, here we go. Wives submit to your husbands. Don't get too excited guys. <laughs> As is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. Okay. And then it continues to write husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children always obey your parents. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. What do you, you know, especially reading that scripture, that passage, what do you think the role of the father is in the family? To set an example. The, the, the father, the husband, the man should set an example. You know, and we need to be the type of people that we want our kids to be. You know, if we want our kids to act a certain way, then we need to act that way. Um, that's why it kind of ties with the last question. I mean, you know, the, the, the things that are going on today, I actually think, you know, being, um, being a believer makes it easier because, hey, forget all the rest of that stuff. Just trust in the Lord, you know, and, you know, first and foremost, we have to walk that walk. You know, if things are rough, we got to stay cool, stay calm. We can't be getting angry and upset. And um, I can't remember the exact part of the, the scripture where it talks about, you know, take, take, you know, to your own detriment, you know, love to your, you know, love your wives to your own, you know, we're, and sometimes we just got to take it, you know, and take, you know, and understand that we're not going to make decisions that are going to make people happy all the time, but just being that calm, consistent, you know, presence, you know, you're not going to be popular all the time or even a lot of the time, but, you know, in the long run, it, it, it's, you know, it's not about what's eternal, you know, or what, what's earthly here on earth. It's about what's eternal, Yeah. you know, and when we're, we're trying to lead, them to the eternal not to make everybody a happy camper you know i think uh you know the wives submit to your husband's part of that i think that becomes a lot easier if we hold up our end of the bargain first yeah you know if if my wife knows that she can trust me and if my wife knows that i am walking with the lord then my wife knows that she can be at ease giving up some, you know, control decisions, whatever, following my example, like Jim was saying, because she knows that, that she can trust me. And it all has to start with me being honorable yeah. so that she can trust me and then we can move forward. Like that. Um, verse 20 of Colossians chapter 3, it says, Children, always obey your parents, for it pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. You know, you hear about fathers that push their kids to do sports or do things that maybe they don't want to do. Um, but then also, too, it's like, you know, hey, you know, you have some fathers that are just not engaging with their kids at all, you know, and just let them just sit in the dark room for all their days, you know. Um, is there a balance between pushing your, 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 your kids uh, versus not engaging or or maybe a balance between, uh, and this is kind of like a twofold question, a balance between tough love and gentleness. Um, you know, what, 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 how do you feel about that? So the father who pushes their, their son or their daughter um, compared to the father who doesn't engage or the father who's very tough love or the father who's just very, very gentle. Um, is there a balance between that? And what, what do you think that balance is? I think, I think that there is a balance. I'm obviously, you know, still learning with my three-year-old. You know, my son... Um, he's very easy to read this way because he's very strong willed. I don't know where he gets that from, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, um, it's very tricky. And, and I've tried different methods with them. I try being really stern, which I've noticed that if I'm 
too stern, like too much, it starts, and what, like what you said, the scripture, it starts aggravating him and then he'll actually flip on you. Um, I, there's got, there's a balance. If I don't engage at all, like you're saying, um, he'll just run rampant and there will be no structure. Um, but if, if I implement, um, and this is that it doesn't work all the time, but if I implement structure and then give him some space, um, sometimes it seems like that works better than anything else so that he can kind of make up his own mind. It doesn't work all the time, but if I keep trying to push, uh, he just becomes aggravated and um, I don't think it's getting us anywhere. And then the parents get aggravated and everybody's aggravated. <laughs> but you're, you're right though. There is a balance. Uh, it, definitely. It's so hard, you know, in like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't push my kids to do anything in terms of, you know, like, and in terms of interests, you know, things like that. I never had anybody to push me. Nobody. I was the youngest of five kids. My mom didn't have the energy to deal with me by the time I was around and we were all within six or seven years of, of age. You know, there's just too many of us. I had to find my own way in terms of, you know, what I liked and which was fine. Cause I, I grew up, I loved baseball. I played baseball, baseball, baseball. I, went outside and played and played and played. I was very self-motivated that way. And when my, when my wife was pregnant with my oldest child, I had the little glove that I had, you know, for him before that he was going to have when he was born. And by the time he was about four or five years old and we'd be out in the yard throwing the ball around and he'd throw it really wild. And I remember running back to get it and I looked over my shoulder and he was running around the corner of the house. He didn't want to play baseball. He <laughs> has zero interest in stick and ball sports or any kind of sports. He doesn't like sports plays water polo Swimming. now but it, it's that's not his thing you know so it's like okay so i give them all the room they want to find their own interest to do you know if you like doing this you like doing that that's that's great my younger son likes to play you know certain video games i let him play got to limit it to, to the greatest extent possible okay hey you're gonna have to get out from behind there well i'm bored well there's your keyboard there's a basketball hoop you know do something else so you know do something else you know make sure that he doesn't just sit in one spot all the time you know i have do different things each day but i let them find their own way in terms of, of what they're interested in you know and, and just just remember to set those guidelines and there are those guidelines and now like i said to, for me it's easier you know because you know I, I i know it's right and i know it's wrong and 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 let the lord the lord will direct the way and he'll make everything right and as, as long as i'm steady and consistent with it they're gonna you know they're completely different people from each other and they're completely different people from me. And, and that's all right. You know, that, that's good. It's like oversight and, you know, it's like good management, you know, give them good oversight and monitoring and get back and let them do their thing to a certain, you know, to a certain extent. <laughs> good stuff. Al, I'm curious about you. Yeah, huh? it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act. All, all three of my kids pursue different interests and I did not, tell them or insist on them to go either way, you know. Uh, they pursue their own interests in life. They always knew that I was there, their mother was there, we loved them, so uh, they was free to pick their own way with some guidance from us, you know. I look at my, uh, uh, my two sons, they all went different ways and showed different business. My daughter, after she decided she was the only one that chose a semi-military career. She went in the Air Force Reserve for eight years and, and did that before she uh, got out and got her degree in teaching. But she, but they all went to different, different ways. No pressure put on them that they must go this way. And I can just sit back now and watch my kids with their kids. They have their hand on their kids and to do the same way. They let them kind of pursue their own interests, but just just be there to love them and be uh, be their parent. Awesome, awesome stuff. Awesome. You know, you know what I'm hearing, Caesar, from every one of these men, is that every one of these men knows each of their children's interests their activities, their, the men are involved. The husbands, the fathers are involved. And when you're involved and you know what your kids' likes and interests are, 
then you can nurture that. You can work with your kids individually because you are there, because you're interested. Um, I, and Chelsea, I don't care if she agrees, she's not going to. I never aggravated my kids, ever, ever. Um, you know, one of the funniest things I loved was, you know, when they're going to school, I'd always get the, the question, you know, hey, Dad, how do I spell this? And you can ask Chelsea. My answer was always the same. It was D-I-C-T-I-O-N-A-R-Y. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the word was, that's how you're going to learn to spell it. And that's what worked for my kids. The other thing, um, earlier somebody had said that, uh, I think it was Jim, said that, you know, he's not as funny as he used to be. Um, I used to know everything. Dads know everything. Well, now I guess my kids are smart enough to know that dads don't know everything, you know, but you, you learn by being there what works for your children. And that's the only way that you can help them to be successful is by you being involved. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, Doug, not only do is it do your kids start realizing that you don't know everything, but I'm brutally honest with my kids, you know, and I tell them, you know, I said, look, I, you know, I, I screwed up. I screwed up. I've told them all my past transgressions in life, you know, and, and, you know, I've horrified the poor kids, you know, but, you know, I've done this and I'm, you know, and, and, and even in current day, you know, I, I messed up here, guys. This is, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm trying my best. And I, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I know they respect me for that and it builds their character up for them to realize it may not be so much now, but somewhere down the road, it will show up in their character. I, Absolutely. Sure that. So I got a question. You have a kid that starts sports and they want to quit in the middle of the season. Is that, is that a negotiation or no? What do you nope. Think? Nope. <laughs> you start it, you finish it. Right. <laughs> you know, you have fathers right now that are watching this video and they are struggling. They may be struggling with custody battles. They may be struggling with blended families. They may be struggling with disciplining their children, not seeing eye to eye with their spouses or, you know, maybe their girlfriends. They could be dating someone and cohabitating. You know, I call it playing house, you know, um, having kids but not married, um, you know, uh, or, or maybe they're just, they don't have kids yet and they're, they're just struggling with the thought of fatherhood. What advice, you know, one of, maybe one of those things I said rang a bell to you, you know, custody, blended families, discipline, cohabitating. What advice would you give on one, maybe one of those issues that may come to your mind right now uh, that you would give to some of these men that may be in some of those situations? Well, um, I'll attack the discipline part of it. Um, don't, you know, uh, uh, what, what was that uh, saying? You know, spare the whip, spoil the child or something like that. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not for beating on kids. Absolutely not. But a well-placed, restrained spanking is effective and it's effective if it's appropriate. Yeah. So discipline appropriately discipline with love and make sure that they understand why they're being disciplined and that, you know, this has to happen, but we'll get through this and we'll get past it. Yeah. Well, you talked, you talked about the, you know, all the different situations that, that people might be in, you know, the, the blended families, the cohabitating, the, you know, all the different situations. There's almost as many different situations now as there were, as there are people. I mean, it's not 2.1 kids in the white big fence anymore. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not. Mrs. Cleaver's not at home cooking, you know, dinner and Ward's not out, you know, bringing home the bacon. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but there's one thing that runs consistent through all situations, and that is God, you know. And the only one piece of, only piece of advice I would ever deem to give anybody on this would be, you know, you, you want to be the father? you want to be the father figure, you want to be the, the man of the house, the leader of the house, then you have to walk in the Lord and you have to put him first and your wife second and your kids third. And you have to have this, make sure you're getting along with your spouse or your playmate or whatever it is in the situation. And, 
And because if it's, if you're not in, you don't have those foundations built, you know, if you don't put the floor down first and then the wall and then the roof, the house is going to tumble, you know, and, and, and it, you know, it may not, I mean, the child might come out on the, on the other side. Okay. You know, but that's, you know, that's the exception rather than the rule, you know, and, and you have to have that house built right. You have to lay that foundation and put up those walls and then cap it with the roof. You know, you have to do it in the right order and it all starts with you and your heart. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I'd say. Yeah. I like to kind of tack, tackle this, uh, uh, blended family business. You know, if you have shared custody, uh, whatever the amount of time it is, you have to know that you're going to have some some disagreements on where the other side of the family are going to be. be. You would hope that both sides are God-loving families and that they would not question the way you are bringing up the child when they're with you. So I would say that they better be careful about what they see or what they hear or what they talk to their child about when they come back to your side. Mm. That's good. That, that's going to bring about some problems. So you have to be careful about your custody. Yeah. Good advice. There's, there's two things um, that I'd like to just say real quick that I've had experience in. One is um, if you're living with, um, your girlfriend before marriage um, advice to that is if you're already there God will acknowledge if you make it right if you haven't done it yet do it the right way I've done it the wrong way it's not worth it doing it God's way he's made it that way for a reason the blessings that will come out of that are going to be so great that it's just not worth doing the wrong way if you can learn from somebody else's mistakes um, just listen to that advice the other one is, is like you're saying, Brother Al, you know, blended families is hard, um, Adam, because uh, you can love another child, but there is a difference um, loving another child and loving one of your own. There is a small difference there. God can fill that gap, but there is a, there is a struggle there, and um, it will take a, a great deal of patience um, to work through those things, but... Um, it can be a great blessing too, but it does take the Lord being in the middle of it. Like Al saying, God can bring that together. Yes. Pastor, I want to add one thing really quick. I'm sorry. Just to, to, okay. to the whole thing about being in, being that leader and being that man and being that godly person, iron sharpens iron, you know, and the, the, you can have the best of intentions, but, but I just fully immerse in yourself and, 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 and learning from, you know, knowing, I can't tell you how much David has taught me, you know, in, in, the, in the past few years. I can't tell you how much that, that the, the example that Al's provided and, and, and just, just to what I've been able to talk to him. I mean, I can't, you know, the leadership that you provided. I mean, we as, as a group of men in our church, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be our church, but, you know, hey, you want the best, you got to go the best. So, um, but, you know, not, not only just, you know, have that intention, but get, you know, get involved with the men, you know, and get knowing, get learning, talk to the men, be with the men and learn from those men. And, you know, it's like, you know, you always learn from someone who knows more than you. Well, everybody knows more <laughs> than me. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just, you know, invest that time, you know, it's well worth it. Any, anybody have any other thoughts that you'd like to share before we close for this wonderful Father's Day video? Happy Good Father's morning. Day. Yeah. Well, the only other understand. thing I could add really quick, I think it was on my heart from the beginning, is I've really learned with my son because he wants to be me. Um, fathers, it is so important that we need to really think how we want our children to grow up. Who do we want our children to be? What do we their characteristics to be because whatever that is we have to be that because they are watching us you know until they know different we are their god in a sense we are the one that they put up on a pedestal we and it's our job to show them the characteristics that they should be and it's also our job to show them the father mm -hmm. you 
you know, and um, I've been trying to do that more so with my son, you know, he's only three, but I want to tell you, they will follow it. My son, my son will pray. In fact, we prayed for my dad before he went into the hospital and I said, Papa, do you want to pray? Yeah, yeah. And he held my hand. I go, do you want to pray? And he started mumbling. And I got a little, he prayed for some stuff off the wall, you know, but then he says, amen, but he did it. Mm -hmm. And it's because he sees an example. I'm not saying I'm a perfect example, but it just shows us fathers that they are watching and they're going to do what we have to do. So let's make sure that we are leading by example. I think it's so important. That's Yep. <laughs> let me let me close with this scripture right here. This is in First John chapter three, verse one. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are.